You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What does Sputnik have to do with student loans? How did a set of trembling hands end the Soviet Union? How did inflation kill moon bases? And how did a former president decide to run for a second non-consecutive term? These are among the topics we deal with on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast. We tell stories of history that relate to today's news events. Give a listen. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics wherever you get podcasts. Hey everyone, welcome to the 245th episode of our Civil War podcast. My name is Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Thanks for tuning in to the podcast. We wanted to let you guys know here at the top of the show that we'll have an announcement at the end of the show about an idea we had for our 250th episode. We'd like to perhaps do something special for that show and, uh, well... We'll talk about it at the end of the episode. But right now, we're going to get back to the Battle of Stones River. As you all will recall, when we left off last time, the fighting had just come to a close on the last day of 1862, and the Confederate attack on December 31st had come close, so very close, to securing that most elusive of Civil War prizes, a decisive battlefield victory. But... But at the end of the day, the Union line had held. Braxton Bragg, the general leading the Confederate Army of Tennessee, had hoped to smash the Union right, snap shut the enemy line like a jackknife, and seize the Nashville Pike, thereby trapping the Yankees against the river. But some stubborn fighting by some Federal units, and the fact that William Rosecrans, the commander of the Union's Army of the Cumberland, had successfully shifted reinforcements to blunt the rebel drive, meant that the jackknife had come perilously close to snapping shut, but at the end of the day, the Confederates had failed to secure a clear-cut victory. That night, both Army commanders took stock. It had been a very bloody day. The Army of the Cumberland had sustained more than 25% casualties and lost 28 cannon while being pushed to the edge of destruction. Five brigade commanders were casualties, along with two division commanders, Wood and Van Cleve, both wounded that afternoon. On the other hand, plenty of ammunition remained for another day of fighting, and the two brigades that had been guarding Rosecrans' supply line against rebel cavalry had come up and joined the army. And so Rosecrans called a meeting of his commanders, although later on there were conflicting accounts about what exactly transpired at the gathering. Several generals favored withdrawing, while others were noncommittal. Rosecrans himself appeared unsure what to do. At one point, he went out and scouted the army's right with McCook, and returned satisfied with it that the line could hold. George Thomas ended all talk of withdrawing by declaring, This army does not retreat. Rosecrans agreed, telling the assembly, Go to your commands and prepare to fight and die here. Rosecrans consolidated and reorganized the army's lines, including abandoning the round forest, and had the troops dig in. A wagon train with the Union wounded departed for Nashville under a strong escort. Across the way, Braxton Bragg, for his part, couldn't have been happier at the day's results. Despite losing more than 8,000 men, the rebel army had driven back the federal right several miles and came incredibly close to total success. That night, Bragg sent a message to Richmond, saying, We assailed the enemy at 7 o'clock this morning, and after 10 hours of hard fighting, have driven him from every position except his extreme left, where he has successfully resisted us. With the exception of this point, we occupy the whole field. 
We captured 4,000 prisoners, including two brigadier generals, 31 pieces of artillery, and some 200 wagons and teams. Our loss is heavy, that of the enemies much greater. End quote. That dispatch, with its implicit promise of decisive victory, was quickly reprinted in Southern newspapers, and when added to the recent Confederate thrashing of the Federals at Fredericksburg in Virginia, it raised people's hopes as the new year dawned that 1863 would see the Confederacy secure its independence. Bragg appeared convinced that Rosecrans would retreat, and the movement of federal troops and the passage of wagons back up the Nashville Pike seemed to reinforce that idea. Since he apparently never seriously considered the possibility that the Federals would stay and fight it out, Bragg called no council of war and issued no orders for the next day. New Year's Day, 1863, dawned cold and rainy. Both sides skirmished as the Confederates probed the Federal position and tried to determine the Yankees' intentions. The Rebel cavalry continued its fourth straight day of attacking Union wagon trains on the road between Nashville and Murfreesboro, disrupting Rosecrans' supply line. Many Federal soldiers spent the day hungry since they hadn't been issued rations since the night of December 30th. On the Union left, in the afternoon, Van Cleve's division of Federals, now led by Colonel Samuel Beatty, crossed Stones River and occupied a wooded ridge overlooking McFadden's Ford and half a mile from Wayne's Hill. The Confederates failed to detect this movement, and Bragg wouldn't find out about it until the next morning. For his part, with no firm plan in place, Braxton Bragg contented himself with spending New Year's Day checking his own army's lines and waiting for Rosecrans to retreat. The Confederate commander, though, was obviously disappointed in his expectation that the Yankees would pull out, and later reported that on January 1st, quote, The whole day passed without an important movement on either side and was consumed by us, in gleaning the battlefield, burying the dead, and replenishing ammunition. On January 2nd, the weather again was cold and rainy. Braxton Bragg realized that an important movement had, in fact, taken place the day before, since once the rebels finally discovered that Beatty's Federals had crossed the river, Bragg understood that the Yankees' position on the ridge gave them a key advantage. Bragg later summed up the situation by saying, quote, General Polk's line was both commanded and enfiladed. The dislodgement of this enemy force or the withdrawal of Polk's line was an evident necessity. In other words, the position of Beatty's division of Federals on the ridge made Polk's portion of the Confederate line untenable, so Bragg had to either eliminate the enemy threat or pull back Polk. But pulling back Polk would open the road to Murfreesboro to the Yankees, so Bragg decided to attack and seize the ridge, and he gave John C. Breckinridge's division orders to attack toward McFadden's Ford. As you guys will recall, most of Breckinridge's division had been sent over to the west side of the river on December 31st to aid in the Confederate effort there, but the division had recrossed the river since then and resumed more or less its original position on the Confederate right. Now, in the attack against Beatty's Federals, Breckinridge's infantry would be aided by rebel horsemen commanded by Wharton and Pegram, and an artillery battalion under Captain Felix Robertson would also support the assault. Breckinridge protested the order to attack. He pointed out to Bragg that the dozens of Union cannon deployed over on the far side of Stones River dominated the ground he was being asked to seize on his side of the river, and so even if his troops managed to capture the ridge held by Beatty's Federals, they would be unable to stay there in the face of the overwhelming Union cannon fire ac- from across Stones River. Bragg, however, refused to cancel his order. Breckinridge returned to his headquarters and told his subordinates about Bragg's order to attack. 
Brigadier General Roger Hansen was so enraged by the senseless directive that he vowed to go and kill Bragg for issuing it, and he had to be restrained from riding off and carrying out his threat. Hansen commanded the Orphan Brigade, so-called because it was made up of Kentuckians serving in the Confederate Army who couldn't go home because the Bluegrass State had officially sided with the Union. It was now about 2.30 in the afternoon, and Breckinridge ordered his lieutenants to prepare for an attack at 4 p.m. Breckinridge planned for his division to surge forward late on this winter's day as the sun was setting so that the onset of darkness would quickly force a halt to the Federal cannon fire and also prevent the Yankees from launching any sort of organized counterattack. Breckinridge's fatalistic view of the attack's prospects, though, infected preparations, and he spent most of his time deploying the four infantry brigades that would participate in the assault, and he made little effort to communicate or coordinate with the rebel cavalry deployed on the infantry's right. Breckinridge also got into a heated dispute with Robertson over the employment of the artillery. Robertson wanted to advance his guns once the objective was secure, while Breckinridge wanted the batteries to move forward alongside his advancing infantry. Bragg's chief of staff was nearby, but refused to step in and referee, and the dispute wasn't resolved before the attack began. The Confederate infantry moved into position with Hanson's Orphan Brigade on the left, Palmer's Tennesseans, now commanded by Gideon Pillow, on the right, William Preston's brigade lined up behind Pillow, and Adams' brigade, now led by Randall Gibson, backing up the Kentuckians. As the Confederates moved into position, Captain John Mendenhall, who commanded the artillery on the Union left, was busy rushing more guns into place. By the time 4 p.m. rolled around, there were 57 Federal artillery pieces in position or rushing to the scene there along the west side of the river. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. I believe that all history, no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics. We go back to source materials in their original languages. And we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast. Wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. At 4 p.m., Breckenridge signaled the advance. He later reported... Quote, Instantly the troops moved forward at a quick step. The front line had bayonets fixed, with orders to deliver one volley and then use the bayonet. On the Federal side, Beatty's two front line brigades, under Colonels Samuel Price and James Fife, absorbed the first shock. 
but Fife later said that the hard-charging Confederates drove Price's men, quote, backwards like fall leaves before a wintry wind. One after another, the lines were swept away. To try to salvage the situation, Beatty committed his reserve brigade, which held up Hansen's advance for a short time and pitted Unionist Kentuckian against Confederate Kentuckian. Some of Gibson's Louisianans came forward and broke the enemy line, forcing the Federals to retreat back toward McFadden's Ford in disorder. Most of Beatty's Federals withdrew across Stones River, although some, Fife's troops and Colonel William Gross's brigade, remained on the near side of the river and formed a small perimeter just downstream of the ford. Nevertheless, in twenty minutes of fighting, Breckenridge's Confederates had achieved their objective. However, the, Confeder- the rebels now pushed their luck too far, as Breckenridge's infantry chased the Yankees down the ridge's rear slope into the open area opposite McFadden's ford. Federal left-wing commander Thomas Crittenden watched the Confederate advance and turned to his artillery chief, Captain Mendenhall, and said, Now, Mendenhall, you must save my men with your cannon. The dozens of Federal artillery pieces lining a bluff overlooking the ford opened up on the rebel infantry. One of the Union Kentuckians remembered how, quote, A continued flash of lightning seemed to light up the scene, and immediately after the welcome crash of our cannon greeted our ears, and whirr over our head went grape and canister, and the yells of elated rebels were turned into the shrieks and groans of dying. A storm of shot and shell ripped through the Confederate ranks. A piece of a shell hit Hansen in the leg as he led the orphan brigade forward, and the wound killed him several days later. Despite the terrible Union defensive fire, several small groups of Kentuckians and Floridians dashed for the river, and a few made it across, but fewer returned when it was impossible for them to maintain their tenuous foothold on the opposite bank. As Mendenhall's artillery broke up the Confederate attack, Federal infantry reinforcements arrived on the scene and launched a counter-strike, pushing across the river. The rebels gave ground grudgingly, but ultimately had to give way. Darkness brought an end to the fighting, with both sides occupying the same ground on the east side of the river that they had held that morning. But it wasn't a draw, because nearly 1,800, or about 38%, of Breckenridge's Confederates had been killed, wounded, or captured. Breckenridge, himself a native of the Bluegrass State, broke down when he saw the shattered remnants of the Orphan Brigade, crying out, My poor orphans! My poor Orphan Brigade! They have cut it to pieces! As night fell, the Union forces opposing Breckenridge on his side of Stones River now outnumbered him two to one, and worse still, Federal cannon were crossing the river and taking up position. At the end of the day, it was obvious that the sacrifice of Breckenridge's division had all been for naught. Braxton Bragg's Happy New Year hadn't lasted long. Facing the prospect of continued dominance of the battlefield by Union artillery and the arrival of Federal reinforcements, Bragg had no choice but to order a withdrawal. There were also troubling cracks beginning to appear in the rebel army's high command, which would burst wide open in the aftermath of Stones River and result in the Army of Tennessee entering the summer of 1863 with the fractured and unhappy command structure that destroyed any sense of teamwork needed to create and sustain Confederate military success in the war's western theater but we'll be talking more about those rebel troubles down the road on the podcast. As for Stone's River, the butcher's bill for the fight was enormous, making it the Civil War's bloodiest major battle when calculated by percentage of loss. In three days of fighting, the Federals lost 13,249 men killed, wounded, or missing out of 46,000 engaged. The Confederates brought about 37,000 men to the battlefield and lost 10,266 men. 
the combined casualty rate of 28% meant that by the numbers, both armies emerged from the fight bloodied and battered. The Confederate withdrawal left Rosecrans in possession of Murfreesboro, but he chose not to press his luck by pursuing the retreating rebels. Instead, he was satisfied to have salvaged a victory from near defeat. A soldier in the 21st Michigan wrote, We have nothing to brag of in this battle. Well, he was right, and he was wrong. The Confederates held the initiative for most of the battle, which had pushed the Army of the Cumberland to the edge of disaster. But in the end, the rebels couldn't break the stubborn Union defense, which spoke well of the Federal soldiers and their commanders. The key to judging the victor at the Battle of Stones River lies not in simply looking at the tactical result, but in measuring its impact months later, and in recalling the reasons the Federals fought a campaign in the dead of winter in Tennessee in the first place. Remember, political pressure had led Abraham Lincoln to press his army commanders to win victories that winter. But in Mississippi, Grant's advance against Vicksburg had come to nothing and in Virginia, Burnside's offensive at Fredericksburg had turned into a blood-stained, embarrassing debacle. That meant that Lincoln's only hope of a win that winter lay with Rosecrans in Middle Tennessee, and at Stones River Lincoln finally got the victory he desired. In the first week or so of January, wildly exaggerated reports of the scale of the federal victory at Stones River flooded northern newspapers, and helped boost morale on the Union home front after the earlier dismal news from Fredericksburg. It also provided Lincoln with a military success to give teeth to the Emancipation Proclamation when it went into effect on January 1st. On the ground in Middle Tennessee, the rich farmland of the region now lay in federal hands and wouldn't be feeding Braxton Bragg's Confederates. Rosecrans spread his army across the region, posting strong garrisons in Franklin and other towns. At Murfreesboro itself, the Federals, and former slaves, labored from dawn until dusk for nearly six months, building the largest earthwork fortification ever constructed on the North American continent. Fortress Rosecrans, as it was called, protected nearly 200 acres of ground, where the Federals created a vast logistical base that eventually held enough supplies and war material to keep 65,000 soldiers in the field for three months. This forward supply depot and base would be the key to Rosecrans' brilliant campaigns that saw his army outmaneuver the Confederates and seize the critical city of Chattanooga by September 1863. Although one can argue that the Battle of Stones River was nearly a tactical stalemate, broken only by the Confederate Army's withdrawal, the larger, big-picture results clearly made it a significant Federal victory. In the short term, it gave Lincoln the military success he needed that winter, and in the long term, the insubordination and near-mutiny among the Southern generals in the aftermath of Stones River poison the Confederate command structure in the war's western theater. While on the Federal side, the victory and subsequent build-up at Murfreesboro would pay major dividends months later and ultimately lead to the fall of Chattanooga, which was the gateway to Atlanta. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is Jefferson Davis and His Generals, The Failure of Confederate Command in the West by Stephen E. Woodworth. We mentioned that down the road on the podcast, we'll be talking some more about the dysfunctional Confederate command situation in the War's Western Theater. And if you want to get a jump on that topic, this book by Stephen Woodworth is a good place to start. We'll also remind you of our book recommendation for episode number 206, which was Braxton Bragg, The Most Hated Man in the Confederacy, by Earl Hess. Don't forget you can find a handy list of all of our book recommendations going all the way back to the very first episode of the podcast if you head over to the show's website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. 
We had a new members episode ready to record, but we decided to put it on the back burner for now, since, as you might have been able to tell from Tracy's voice and her limited role in this show, she's got a summertime cold and isn't feeling very well, and so was on light podcast duty this weekend. At any rate, we did want to give a shout out to the newest member of the Strawfit Brigade, Susan W. Thanks, Susan. All right, now to the big announcement about episode number 250. We want to do something special for that show, so we decided that we'd ask you guys to send in questions for us to answer, and we'd do a Q&A with that episode, either for the whole show or part of it, depending on how many questions you send us. Uh, you know, maybe we'll only get like three. But anyway, your questions can be about the Civil War or anything else, within reason, uh, if there are personal questions. But to sweeten the pot a bit, we're going to connect it to a giveaway. You see, we recently received a copy of Echoes of Glory, the Illustrated Atlas of the Civil War, which, if you've been around a while, you know is our go-to Civil War atlas. But we received a copy of it from a listener up in Boise, Idaho, Stephen S., who ended up with two copies of it through a mix-up, and he passed along one to us. He suggested we use it to give away on the podcast, so we thought we'd tie it to our, our idea for episode number 250. And so everyone who sends us a question for that show through Facebook or Twitter or email or on the website, well, your name will go into a hat and we'll have a drawing during the 250th episode to see who wins the atlas. So send in your question and you might win the atlas. Exactly. Um, well, so just to let you know what's coming up now that we've finished with the Battle of Stones River, well, we're going to do at least a couple of 1862 year in review episodes like we did when we reached the end of 1861 since those shows seem to be pretty popular with you all but after those year in review shows we'll hit the ground running in 1863 okay that's it i think uh, so we'll say thanks for listening to this episode of the civil war 1861 to 1865 a history podcast Tracy and I do hope you'll join us again next time, but until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.